there are only four places on the planet that you can invest your money. You can invest your money in companies, either private companies or publicly traded companies. The publicly traded ones I call stocks, so does most people. You can put your money in bonds, right? And you can put that in corporate bonds or municipal bonds or government bonds or private bonds, but you could put your money in bonds. Uh, the third place is currencies. You could put your money in currencies. That could be the dollar, the yen, the yuan, the euro. Or you could put your money in physical assets, which typically is split between real estate and commodities. But that's it. There are no other places on this planet to put your money. And typically, I don't talk about currencies because, well, I'm not a currency trader. I'm not a currency investor. But what I've noticed over the last 19 years of working with people is we we by default become currency investors, not, not deliberately, but when I meet someone who's like, well, I'm not doing anything right now, I'm just sitting in cash. Well, if that person's cash is the US dollar, then they're invested in the US dollar. If that person's cash is the yen or the yuan or the euro, then they're invested in that. And they don't see themselves being invested in currencies, but that's what they're doing. So deliberately, most people don't, or I should say consciously, most people don't invest in currencies, but we almost all do because we you know, get paid in these currencies. And currencies can really impact how one should uh, structure their portfolio. So when there's a currency that is doing, a major currency that is doing something um, that we should really take a look at, um, I want to point it out to you. I don't usually talk about the Chinese yuan, and I'm not going to talk about it here. And one of the reasons is because it's pegged to the U.S. dollar. Now, they're starting to loosen that peg, but until it gets unpegged, um, it's not really that real of a currency. It needs to be a free-floating currency like the Japanese yen is and the European euro is and the U.S. dollar. And those are really the three big ones um, again, we'll have four big ones once the yuan lets their own currency float, but really not until then. So the two biggest currencies are the euro and the dollar, and the dollar being more dominant, not from a GDP, because the gross domestic product of Europe is much bigger than the U.S., but the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency and has been that way since the end of World War II. So when something ends, uh, ends so when something happens with one of these currencies, I think it's really important to look at. Hey everybody, this is RC Peck, and this is my weekend podcast. Um, so great to have you here. And there's a lot of funny images <laughs> when you go online and compare Europe and the U.S. And this was one of the more um, PG-rated <laughs> comparisons between. The two, and yes, I know the Mona Lisa is not from this country called Europe, but a country called France. Uh, but I guess I could say that Mickey Mouse is not from the U.S. It's from California, and the California economy is bigger than the French economy. So both those countries sit inside the bigger entity. But I want to compare two currencies with you and talk about what is happening and how that might impact your portfolio. And I only have two price charts for you, but they're two important price charts. The first is the U.S. dollar, and you have seen this price chart from me before. Um, it was in, that's past tense now, a 22-month sideways channel. And that sideways channel was about 7.5% high. So it was chopping sideways for 22 months. And then... President-elect Trump got elected, and the now it was moving up before Trump happened. In fact, the dollar broke out of this consolidating triangle right here back at the beginning of October, moved up, came back down, and then we had the elections right around here, November 8th. I'm not varying on the date, but I'm thinking this is probably about November 8th here, and the dollar broke out of the 22-month channel. Now, this is important because this has been stabilizing a lot of things, and there was a huge 25% move of the U.S. dollar before it moved into the 7 or 8% sideways channel. But now we see the U.S. dollar that has broken out. It has come back down here, and I know this is probably small on your screen, but what happened is the dollar broke out of this to the upside, 
out of this 22 month channel, came back down, sat on top of the channel. So what used to be a ceiling or resistance, right? Couldn't get above it, couldn't get above it, couldn't get above it. It finally broke through that ceiling and that ceiling has now become a floor. So the question is, if the dollar moves up, like if it doesn't just break back down into the channel, but if it stays above the channel and breaks above, let's call it this 102 right here, that is super significant. It's already significant that it's broken above the 22 month channel, but less so if it moves right back into it. And so this is really important because if this moves higher, it's gonna impact what a lot of other assets do on the planet, including things that you might own. Now, the reason why I'm not calling it a victory that yes, it's broken out and it's gonna move higher is because of this second price chart and the last price chart I wanna show you, and this is the European Euro. Now, as your brain can almost um, automatically and immediately see, it's almost the reverse of the US dollar, right? So what's interesting is, let's call this line at the bottom here, let's just call it 105. That means it takes a dollar five US dollar, one dollar and five cents to buy the euro at this black horizontal line at the bottom. And at the top, it takes the dollar, um, it takes one dollar and 15 cents to buy the euro. So the euro has not been able to break below that 105. It tried once, twice, three, four, five times. And here we are again. Now, even though the US dollar has clearly broken out of its 22 month channel. The euro hasn't done it yet. Now, part of the reason is because the US dollar is not just up against the euro. It's up against, well, I shouldn't say up against, but it's compared to a basket of other currencies, the euro being the biggest weighting. I believe it's about 67%. And then you have the yen and you do have the yuan and you do have the British pound and you actually do have the Swedish krona. Um, but it's gonna be hard for the dollar to break out and above that 102 if the euro does not break below 105. And so what I think we're really watching here is what does the euro do? Is it gonna break below? Is Mario Draghi gonna say more things here? And he just said something this week that he's gonna continue the money printing. Uh, it was supposed to end in March of 2017. Probably no one on the planet is surprised that he extended it another six months to September 2017. But he said that he was going to lower the amount that they were printing moving forward from March to September. So in our crazy, wacky world, that means <laughs> less printing makes the euro's strength weaker or it weakens the strength. But it's not real. It hasn't really lost yet until it breaks below this 105, and and you know significantly and clearly breaks lower. If it does, then the combination of those two, it's really going to put a lot of pressure on a, a handful of assets, and this may impact what you're doing with your portfolio and how you do with it. So, what's the takeaway? I could have said a weak euro puts downward pressure, but I'm saying a strong US dollar puts downward pressure on precious metals. Now, it doesn't mean precious metals are going to crash, but it's going to put a lot of downward pressure on precious metals because, look, if the dollar is strong and doing well, what, what the world is basically saying is, hey, we're good. No, there's no uncertainty. We're going to you know, elect Donald Trump. And he's going to deregulate everything. And he's going to make, quote unquote, America great again, which, by the way, was a slogan or the slogan of Ronald Reagan. Um, the difference between Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump, and not that there's just one difference, but Ronald Reagan was elected at the beginning of what I call an expansion cycle. And an expansion cycle is when the stock market's price to earnings ratio is in a very long-term expansion of that number getting bigger. So in 1980, the P.E. ratio was 6. And by the end of 1990s, or let's just call it 2020 years later, the P.E. ratio was 45. 
So that was an expansion cycle. Since the year 2000, even today, the as reported P ratio has been contracting. So we've been in a contraction cycle. And he's coming in near the end part of a contraction cycle. So it's going to be very interesting, at least for me, to watch how very Ronald Reagan-like policies are going to affect the country when one came in at the beginning of an expansion cycle and the other is coming in at the end of a contraction cycle. And let me just tell you, those two cycles, it really determines everything. So the reason I bring this up is because um, during a contraction cycle, which we've been in for 16 years, um, gold is one of the best assets to be in. So if the dollar gets strong, and look, it is possible for the dollar to be strong and gold to be strong. Absolutely. Um, it may not happen right now at the same time. So there will be downward pressure on precious metals. The other thing that it will put downward pressure on is what I call soft, not just me, soft commodities, coffee, sugar, cocoa. So commodities that are predominant, predominantly um, priced in U.S. dollars, right? That's going to put downward pressure. Now, oil is predominantly priced in uh, U.S. dollars too, but that is... Um, consistently and quickly changing around the world where it's being priced in other currencies, namely uh, the Chinese yuan. But the other area it's going to put downward pressure on is large cap stocks in the U.S., right? Because the majority of large cap stocks, probably about 65%, um, they get a significant amount of their income from overseas, right? We, They have, we have, I'm an American, <laughs> Um, they have global brands, and those global brands are very, well, big outside the U.S. And so if people are going to buy Fords in Europe or people are going to buy U.S. products overseas, then they're going to be having to pay more because the U.S. dollar is stronger. Now, the inverse of that is European stocks should be greatly helped by the euro breaking below that 105 and the dollar breaking above its 102. So the rever the reverse could be that it's going to help put an upward bias on European stocks. And man, do they <laughs> do they need the help because for the last seven years, they have been noticeably and consistently underperforming U.S. domestic stocks. So that's something to make note of. Now, look, the market knows about what's going on with the currencies but this is a very dominant move that is happening right now. And like I say, if it's confirmed by the euro breaking below that 105 and or, and I think they're both going to happen, so it's an or, or the dollar breaking above. Now, I say 102 because on the dollar price chart, it has to break above 102. Um, but that doesn't mean 102 euro. Just take those as numbers. So that's going to really impact how people structure their portfolio. Hey guys, this is just another step in helping you protect your portfolio and your future. Until next time, this is RC Peck. Hey guys, it's so great to have you here. I know I mentioned this last week, but I've got this super cool uh, training that I have coming up and I'm putting the final touches on it over the next week or so. And it's really about filtering out all the crazy information that is, that is hitting your brain about investing and how do you filter it all out and really get to what matters most, right? Should you even be in the market at all? Maybe you shouldn't even be. And if you are, what is the best location of stocks, international or domestic? And then once you know that, what is the best sized stock? You don't want to be in all size. You don't want to be in small cap and mid cap and large cap and mega cap. You don't want to be in domestic and exposed to international. This is These are ideas that were born out of the 50s that were cemented in the 70s and they were never updated. People are literally growing their money in strategies that were designed over 40 years ago. And then lastly, what is the best type stock you should be in? Is it one sector or the other sector. This magic filter tells you where they should be, including even if you should be in the market at all. So that will be coming up. So thanks so much, guys. Thank you so much for being in my world. I can't believe that 2016, oh my gosh, is almost over and 2017 is starting. I mean, sometimes I, 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 I don't even write 2016. I still write 2015. And now I need to be writing 2017. So... um 
we got a lot of things that are working, a lot of things that are going great. So I look forward to speaking with you guys uh, a couple more times before the end of the year. Okay, you guys take care, and I'll speak to you soon.